And good afternoon. It's Thursday, the 21st of January, 2021. Actually, it's this kind of a special day for me. The 21st of January is my parents' wedding anniversary. They were married on this date, the 21st of January, back in 1934. So this would have been their 87th wedding anniversary. They always liked the day. I always enjoyed spending it. It happened soon after my birthday, not in day in years, but in, in the days uh, between birthdays. And we used to spend it, we used to go away uh, either to to take a weekend trip or a two-day trip uh, and honoring my birthday and their anniversary every year. So there's a lot of good memories attached uh, to this date. Well, it's good to be back. This is our 36th episode, uh, if we don't count the one in my backyard during the COVID quarantine. Tested positive for COVID. We got shut down for two weeks. Uh, I went into quarantine, somehow got through the quarantine, uh, and I'm back. So it is really good to be back. One of the things that I discovered during quarantine is I really have to look for things to do. I don't think I'm going to be a good retiree someday many years down the road. Uh, being trapped in the house and looking for something to do every day uh, took a lot of, lot of effort. So I think I'm going to keep working for as long as I can. It'll be good for my, my mental state for sure. As we mentioned at church over the weekend, uh, the reservation system is going to remain in place. The governor is saying the current restrictions will likely be in place at least for the next 30 days. And when I spoke with the diocese, they were indicating that they kind of thought the restrictions would stay in place at least through Easter. So looks like we're getting ready for another season of keeping the reservation system going, keeping our numbers in check, making sure we take temperatures and phone numbers and names and things like that. We'll do what we can, but we'll look forward to staying open. There was some rain that was predicted for earlier this week, uh, but it didn't come, and hopefully now towards the end of the week we're going to get some. In fact, it's looking really good for Friday and Saturday that there might be some decent rain coming to paradise, so we're hoping for that. We didn't have anything of a monsoon season. We're beyond 280 days without rain, so hopefully it is coming, and that will be really, really good. Ash Wednesday is coming up on the 17th of February. We're going to work out what we have to do for it. Uh, the Vatican is suggesting that we just say the prayer once, bless the ashes, uh, and then have you come up and after disinfecting my hands, I sprinkle ashes on the top of your head. I'm not really comfortable with doing that. Uh, another person suggested, well, why don't we buy a camel's hair brush and you dip it in the ashes and then just trace across on your forehead. I said, well, that would defeat the whole purpose of not touching you since that brush would touch one person and then the same brush would touch the next person. Then someone came up with the idea, well, why don't we buy a couple of hundred camel's hair brushes and dip a different brush in and then do the forehead and then put the brush down, take a new brush for the next person. Well, the problem with that would be is each brush would have some of the blessed ashes on it, which is a sacramental, so we would have to burn 300 brushes at the end. The best suggestion I've had so far is, well, what about Q-tips? If we got Q-tips, dip it in the ash, trace the sign of the cross, put the Q-tip down, use a new Q-tip, go through several hundred, and burning several hundred Q-tips would take less effort, less fire, less problem uh, than brushes. So we'll see what we end up doing. We may go back to the Vatican's dripping ashes on your forehead, uh, although I honestly can't see why we couldn't just, as in the old days, dip our thumb in the ashes, make the sign of the cross in your forehead. If you're uncomfortable uh, with that, then don't come up for ashes uh, because there's no requirement whatsoever to get ashes. It's just a, a time-honored custom within our Catholic Church. 
Feast of St. Blaise comes up on February 3rd, and we've traditionally blessed throats using two crossed candles uh, by the person's neck. I know the church doesn't want us to use candles that might possibly touch the person, so we may have to just do the blessing of St. Blaise verbally uh, without the candles, or maybe we'll just make sure we hold the candles far away from you as we give it. These are all beautiful customs, and we hate to see them go by the board. I've spoken with Father Michael Moore. He is looking forward very much to being here for the parish mission from the 22nd through the 25th of January. I'm working out with the diocese our plan for that, how we will enter, how we will exit the church, how we will take reservations, take temperatures, make sure we have a phone list for all the people who attend. And as soon as I get that definitely locked down, we'll make sure we get that word out either by way of the Sunday Mass or by way of the, a letter that we'll send out. Our next letter will go out in February. Uh, we sent one out uh, this week. You should have it uh, actually today in your hands. Uh, but we'll send another one out in February with as final details on all of these things. I should mention that Father Michael Moore is a COVID survivor, as is Dake and Dan and myself. All of us have tested positive. All of us have come through the quarantine. All of us feel that we're ready to be back and working successfully with you. So we have a little bit in common there. And I know Father Michael is looking forward to being with us again. I think this will be his 14th year doing our parish mission. So I look forward very much to having him here with us with us. We're also planning on the dedication of the Garces Center. The diocese has already told me there can be no refreshments. We can't do anything that would encourage or allow you to take off your masks during the uh, dedication ceremony. A uh, couple of things. They've reminded me that uh, the building, the new Garces Center, is fire rated for only 275 people. I have no idea in my mind why that is rated less than the church when it's larger than the church. But 275 people, 25% uh, of that would only be 68 people that we would be allowed to have for the dedication. Again, I'm trying to work it out with the diocese if we couldn't divide into groups and have one group of, let's say, we take the number 68, one group of 68 in the church, maybe another group of 68 outside in the courtyard, and a group of 68 uh, in the Garces Center, and then do part of the blessing, do a little walkthrough, do some disinfecting, bring the next group in, continue the blessing, do a little walkthrough, bring the next group in, so that we could get maybe two or three times 68 people to share in our happiness. That's one of the great things. We've looked forward to this building for so long. So hopefully that will be resolved very quickly and I'll be able to tell you what the plan will be. Meanwhile, we've looked at the dates. I was sure in my mind that Father Garces was here on the 4th of March. And I was right, he was here on the 4th of March, but according to his diary, he actually arrived here on the 3rd. So the 3rd would have been the first day that he saw the area, and the 4th was the day he was in the area and eventually left from our area, continuing on towards California. So that gives us another date we can kind of play with. While I'd like to have the dedication on the 4th, uh, we could also have it on the 3rd, and it would still be just as significant the first time he got to see uh, our area, what is now uh, Laughlin, Nevada. I will definitely keep you posted whenever we hear something. Definitely want our Bishop, George Leo Thomas, to be down to do the dedication. Our building is the first building in the diocese named for Father Garces. So it is a significant event. It was also constructed during the COVID virus, and it was also constructed during the 25th anniversary of the Diocese of Las Vegas. So it is significant. We definitely want the bishop to be here. 
There are two other people that I definitely want from the diocese to be here, and that is Father uh, Monsignor, rather, Greg Gordon. Monsignor Gordon is the new vicar general, the second in command of our diocese. Monsignor Gordon has a long history of being interested in the Father Garza story and his visiting our area. In fact, it was Monsignor Gordon and his brother uh, who were very much responsible for initiating the idea of getting the state sign put up again here in Laughlin, uh, remembering the visit of Father Garces. The third person I want from the diocese, besides the bishop and Monsignor Gordon, is our very first priest here in Laughlin, Father John McShane. Father John McShane has written about Father Garces and has a great interest in him, and certainly uh, it would be beautiful to have Father John be here with us for the dedication. Uh, we're all trying to get that lined up, most likely the 4th of March, perhaps the 3rd of March, Hopefully we'll be able to get the details uh, narrowed down as soon as possible. It is kind of exciting in that we were able to do this during a pandemic, and we're looking forward to being able to do something, so many things, with that building in the years ahead. It's going to be a permanent addition to our campus here, and certainly one that is very, very beautiful. As I mentioned at the Masses on Sunday, I spent part of my time during the quarantine listening to the diary of Father Garces. I found an online version. It's translated in 1909 from Spanish to English, and there were many copious notes along with it. Uh, and my uh, computer reads to me in a young Australian voice. The boy's name is actually Mark. Uh, and so I had a Spanish diary read in English from a 1909 translation by a young Australian. It was fun. It was exciting for me to spend those days, several hours a day for several days, listening to the diary of Father Garces from 1775 and 1776. And I loved his stories. I love the fact that he mentions in there uh, about liking chocolate. I think that's kind of interesting to hear. He mentions a lot of the things he saw on the way. And one of the great things in my mind about Father Garces is that he really liked being with the Indians that he encountered, the various tribes. He wasn't just a job. He wasn't just a missionary who came here from Spain in order to convert the Indians and to help uh, the colonization of the area. He actually liked being with the Indians. In fact, that was one of the criticisms of him, that he enjoyed their food. He enjoyed being with them. He would sit in a circle, cross-legged with them, and they said he's almost like an Indian himself. And I think that's one of the great compliments that we have to Father Garces as a successful missionary. He really liked what he did, and he really liked the people with whom he, he got to do it. I enjoyed seeing some of the stories that were mentioned in the diary, and one of my favorites from this time through, and every time I, I listen to it or read a part of it, I, I learn something new. But he talked about, he was with a group of four Indians from one of the tribes, perhaps uh, near the Mojave Indians, and he had gotten separated from them. He wanted to go on to some other villages, and they, for whatever reason, did not want to accompany him. So he went off on his own, and he was gone for a few weeks on his own, and he mingled with this other tribe of Indians. And somewhere during those few weeks, this other tribe of Indians, somewhere in what is now Arizona, uh, they prepared a, a lavish dinner for him. And while he was enjoying the dinner with the tribal chiefs and the people, he noticed that there was the head of an animal. Uh, and he presumed it was the head of the animal that they were eating uh, over there. And it was on display. And he looked at it and he felt that he had seen it before. In fact, he said it looked strangely like the mule that the four Indians and I had back earlier in the journey. Well, he went on with the dinner, and he continued with his diary, and about a week or two later, he got reunited with the original group of Indians. And when he got back, 
one of the first things they said to him is that our mule had escaped from us. And Father Gar says he could almost see in the diary, he knew where that mule had gone, and he knew that he had actually eaten it, uh, and he remembered it. It's things like that in the diary that make it, I think, just so so real and so so human and so, so beautiful, really, uh, to see it. Also, there are a couple of Indians show up in the diary as being particular friends with Father Garces. And I think that's significant, too. There was one who had the, uh, the Christian name of Sebastian, and there was another one who was known as Palma. These, from various tribes, not only accompanied Father Garces through various parts of his journeys, but they enjoyed his friendship, and he enjoyed their friendship so very, very much. It's, it's kind of beautiful to see things like that, not only in the diary, but in the notes about it, and in, in the references made by, by other people. Father Garces was part of a, a long history of Spanish missionaries, and it's good to remember them. Uh, two that come to mind, Father Junipero Serra, who explored much of California, is responsible for much of the mission system in California, uh, was known to Father Garces, and they were a little bit close to being contemporaries. Father Junipero Serra was a little bit older than Father, Father Garces. Uh, and then there was a Father Eusebio Kino, Father Kino, who uh, colonized and missionized uh, much of what is now Texas. Uh, and also, he was earlier still, uh, but he was, his missionary journeys were known to Father Garces as well. It's kind of nice to see how all this kind of worked uh, together as they go. Mentioning that Garces Center, uh, we're looking at various things that are going to be in it and that we're going to do in it. And one of the things I, I want to mention is we have about a hundred really nice plastic and metal folding chairs. These are really good quality, really quite comfortable, really very sturdy. So I'm going to give you a little demonstration with them a little later in this video and let you see just how easy they open, how secure they are, and perhaps you might have a use for them in your own backyard or as a, an idea for extra seating in your house when you have company or are doing an event. Uh, we figure they're probably worth an awful lot more, but we want to move them since we're clearing out the rectory in preparation for the sale of the rectory. And so what we've decided is, if anybody is interested in these chairs, and there's about a hundred of them, uh, we're going to sell them for $25 each. I'll give you a demonstration of how easy they are and how sturdy they are. We have a sample up at the church so that when you come to church this weekend, you can take a look at the sample. And if you're interested in purchasing any of them, would we'll say $25 each. And all of that money will go right to the Garces Center. Uh, we will not uh, use it for any other purpose. It will be used uh, for the Garces Center. So look forward to showing you a little bit how just how beautiful these chairs are. This is the sample of the chair that I was telling you about in the show. It's very easy, beautiful white solid plastic, opens very easily, solid as a rock, very easy to sit in and very easy to open. It's kind of weighty when you pick it up, but it's really solid. You feel like you're sitting in a real chair, not really a folding chair, and yet it goes up put away and store it. So if you're interested in any of these, $25 will get you one of our hundred chairs or as many of them as you would like to purchase for $25 each. And the money all goes to the Garces Center. Thanks. You know that this week I celebrated my 73rd birthday on January the 19th a birthday I proudly share with singer Dolly Parton, with author Edgar Allan Poe, uh, and with uh, General Robert E. Lee from the Confederacy. 
I've always enjoyed the fact that my birthday was also the birthdays of famous people throughout history. I can't sing like Dolly Parton. I can't write like Edgar Allan Poe. And I certainly do not have the commanding presence of a general like Robert E. Lee. But it's kind of nice to know that it all kind of configures. I always remember them uh, as I celebrate uh, my birthday. And I enjoy very much having the birthday. I, I like the greetings. My phone was ringing off the hook on the 19th. I got text messages from various people. My brother Michael sent me three lottery tickets from New York State. And so I was able to scratch those off and I actually won $10. Uh, he had paid $15 for the tickets, but I won $10 on the tickets, and so I have to mail those back to him in New York and, and get him to send me my money through there. Eddie and Andy were supposed to come out and spend my birthday with me, but they were unable to come because Andy actually picked up a, an audition for a commercial project at noon on my birthday. And so he had to be back in California, and they weren't able to come and spend it. But we're looking forward to spending some time together, perhaps as early as February. We're looking forward to that very much. I told you in the sermon on Sunday about the fact that two months before my birth, uh, my father and mother had flown from Miami to Havana, Cuba in November of 1947 during a thunderstorm. Scared the daylights out of my mother. I was almost born in Cuba. Didn't get her to fly again till 1968. Uh, and I don't remember any of that, but I remember hearing the stories of it. And also, the fact that my mother heard, I'm looking over a four-leaf clover in the delivery room as I was being born. Always liked that song and always uh, enjoyed it very, very much. I told you that uh, during the quarantine, I got to open a lot of gifts. Some of them were birthday gifts, and some of them were gifts from Christmas. Uh, I didn't bring any over to show you because I'll use them for sort of a show-and-tell at Mass later on the road. But one of the gifts that I got was a bottle of wine with a beautiful owl on the label. I have never seen an owl wine. Uh, I don't know much about it or about the brand that uses the owl for its symbol, but it's definitely something I want to learn a little bit more about. And remember all the pictures that we have sent out in the various letters over the course of the pandemic? One person took those pictures and had them made for me into a set of coasters. And so I'll have them around my house. It's kind of a nice remembrance. Another person had a, a coffee mug made for me, which is emblazoned with all of those pictures around it. So that's a nice addition uh, to my kitchen cupboard. <clears throat> And certainly I enjoy looking back at those pictures and enjoying the memories that they bring back to me. I also got a really nice surprise the week of my birthday. It happened a few days before my birthday. <clears throat> got a call in the afternoon and the voice said, this is a voice from your past. And I'm like, a voice from my past? And I listened and he mentioned one or two things and I went back to the 1970s turned out that he was one of my altar boys in the 1970s, back in my first parish in New Jersey. His name was Jack Crowley, and I got to speak with him, and it was wonderful. We stayed on the phone uh, later that day for almost an hour, just talking to one another, remembering people, and remembering various people that uh, we knew. And he said to me as we were talking, he said, do you ever hear from John McCarthy? And John McCarthy was one of his friends, one of the same group of the altar boys in that in that day and age. And I said, I haven't heard from John in a while. He says, oh, he says, I'll text you John's phone number and you can give him a call. And I figured, oh, that'd be a great idea. So I hung up from him and I'm waiting for the text with John's phone number. And lo and behold, John calls me. So John McCarthy, out of the 1970s, calls me and wanted to talk. And, oh, it was had such fun catching up, going back like some 40 years uh, of memories and people and who's doing what and what's happening, all with that. And I said, you know what I remember, John? And he said, what? And I said, I remember when you came out to visit me in Nevada. 
And that was years ago, probably a dozen years ago or more. Uh, and he, John had come out, and we were up in Las Vegas, and we went to see the show Splash uh, at the Riviera Hotel. And when we came out of the show, they had a display in the lobby, uh, kind of the showroom lobby, and it was a flight simulator. And you could go into the flight simulator and pretend to be flying a plane. It was a realistic, very well done one. And John knew of my interest, my Air Force connection. And he said, would you like to try that? And I said, oh, I would love that. And so he said, come on, I'll treat, get in. So I got into the flight simulator and I'm there and I'm enjoying it. But then after a while, it just seemed this is going on for a long, long time. And I'm still enjoying it, but I'm beginning to notice it's a long time that I'm in here. And it finally ended, and I got out and I said to John, I said, that just seemed like a really long experience, a ride in there. He said, I know, I just kept handing the guy money and said, keep it going, he's having a good time. And so that's my flight experience with the, the flight simulator in Las Vegas. I actually got one other time in my life I got to use a flight simulator, and that was with the United States Air Force. I was at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware, and there's an actual flight simulator built by United Airlines at the base, and it's actually used in the training of pilots for C-5s, the huge cargo planes that the Air Force uses, the C-5A, actually. And I was there one day, and the instructor said, Chaplain, would you like to try the flight simulator? And I said, oh, I would love that. So he gave me a couple of quick instructions and got me inside. And the simulator was so realistic for Dover Air Force Base. Everything was uh, visually correct, so that when you looked out towards the, the runway and through the cockpit, it actually looked like the runway at Dover Air Force Base. When you looked out the windows to the side, it actually looked like the background of Dover. And I was having a great time. I was flying, I was running and doing touch and goes on the runway, and all of a sudden, the whole thing went black. Could see nothing. And I waited, it was very, very quiet, and the instructor opened the door and said, well, chaplain, we're all dead. And I said, what? He said, yep, you crashed the plane. He said, but on the bright side, he said, you crashed it a lot closer to the runway than many other chaplains. So I was always kind of proud of that. I crashed closer to the runway than other chaplains. Well, as I said, we'll keep you posted on developments for the dedication for Ash Wednesday, for the Feast of St. Blaise. We look forward to doing that. And now it's time for Pascal to give us his usual visit. And he comes down to us with his message. And actually, it's a very simple word. Libertas. And as you might guess already, libertas refers to liberty or freedom. And I was thinking about freedom this week, and I remembered, and maybe some of you will remember, there was a show, a Broadway musical, that came out in 1974, and it was called Shenandoah. And it was the story of a Virginia farmer back at the time of the Civil War. Beautiful music, beautiful uh, whole storyline of how the Civil War tore a family apart and how they had to, to deal with it. But one of the great songs that I think is too often overlooked from Shenandoah is a song called Freedom. I'm not going to attempt to sing it to you, but you might remember some of the words because it had kind of a folk song quality to it. Uh, and one of the verses, the opening verse, actually went, Freedom in a state like Maine or Virginia, freedom in a cross some county line, freedom is a flame that burns within you, freedom is a state of mind. Perhaps we might keep that state of mind that we're a free people, that our freedom extends to freedom of religion, freedom of speech, 
freedom to assemble, freedom to do all the things that we've grown up loving about our great country, America. Keep freedom, libertas, as they would say in Latin, in your mind. It's a state of mind, no matter what's happening around us. It's good to know that. God bless and have a really great day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.